Real Saga Skatla Grimsonar Egil Saga Chapter 10 Thorolf in Finnmark In the winter, Thorolf took his way up to the fells with a large force of not less than 90 men. He took with him plenty of wares for trading. At once he appointed a meeting with the Finns, took of them the tribute, and held a fair with them. All was managed with goodwill and friendship, though not without fear on the Finn side. Far and wide about Finnmark did he travel, but when he reached the fells eastward, he heard that the Kalfings were come from the east, and they were there for trading with the Finns, but in some places to plunder as well. Thorolf set Finns to spy out the movements of the Kylfings, and he followed after to search for them, and came upon thirty men in one den, all of whom he killed, letting none escape. Afterwards he found together fifteen or twenty. In all they slew near upon a hundred of them, and took immense booty, and returned in the spring after doing this. Thorolf then went to his estates at Sonnes and remained there through the spring. He had a long ship built, large and with a dragon's head, fitted out in the best style. This he took with him from the north. Thorolf gathered great stores of what was there in Hologoland, employing his men after the herrings and in other fishings. Seal hunting there too was in abundance and egg gathering and all such provisions he had brought with him. Never had he fewer freed men about his home than a hundred. He was open-handed and liberal, and readily made friends with the great, and all who were near him. A mighty man he became, and he bestowed much care on his ships, equipment, and weapons. Chapter 11 King feasts with Thorolf. King Harald went that summer to Hologoland, and banquets were made ready against his coming. Both were his estates, and also by barons and powerful landowners. Thorolf prepared a banquet for the king at great cost. It was fixed for when the king should come. To this he bade a numerous company, the best men that could be found. The king had about three hundred men, and with him came to the banquet. But Thorolf there had five hundred men. Thorolf had caused a large granary to be fitted up where the drinking should be, for there was no hall large enough to contain all those people. And all around the building shields were hung. The king sat in the high seat, but when the foremost bench was filled, then the king looked round, and he turned red, but spoke not, and men thought they could see that he was angry. The banquet was magnificent, in all the viands of the best. The king, however, was gloomy. He remained there for three nights, as had been intended. On the day when the king was to leave, Thorolf went to him and offered that they should go together down to the strand. The king did so, and there, moored off the land, floated the dragon ship which Thorolf had had built, with tent and tackling complete. Thorolf gave the ship to the king, and prayed the king to believe that he had gathered such numbers for this to show the king honor, and not to enter into rivalry with him. The king took Thorolf's words well, and then became merry and cheerful. Many added their good words, saying as was true that the banquet was most splendid, and the farewell escort magnificent, and the king gained much strength by such men. Then they parted with much affection. The king went northwards through Hologland as he had promised, and returned south as summer wore on. He went to yet other banquets that were prepared for him. Chapter 12 Hildurida's Sons Talk with Harald 
Hilderida's sons went to the king and bade him a three nights banquet. The king accepted their bidding and fixed when he would come. So at the appointed time he and his train came there. The company was not numerous, but the feast went off very well, and the king was quite cheerful. Harak entered into talk with the king, and their talk turned to this, that he asked about the king's journey in those parts during the summer. The king answered his questions, and said that all had received him well, each after his means. Great will have been the difference, said Harak, and at Torgar the company at the banquet will have been most numerous. The king said that this was so. Harak said, that was to be looked for, because on that banquet most was spent, and you, O great king, had great luck in matters so turning out that your life was not endangered. The end was as likely, though, very wise and very fortunate, for at once suspected all was not for good, seeing the numerous company that Thorolf had gathered there. And I am told that you made many armed men and kept them constantly on guard and on watch for you, both night and day. The king looked at him and said, Why do you speak like this, Harak? What can you tell me? Harak answered, May I speak with permission? Speak, said the king. This I judge, said Harak, that thou would not deem it be well of me, king, for you to hear every word what men say in speaking of their minds freely, and what they think, the tyranny that you exercise over all people. But the plain truth is, O king, that to rise against you the people lack nothing but boldness in the right leader. Nor is it wonder in a man like Thorolf that he thinks himself above everyone. He wants not for strength, he keeps a guard round him like a king. He has wealth in plenty. You too have bestowed on him large lands, and he now made all ready to repay them with ill. For this is the truth that I tell you. When it was learned that you were coming north to Logoland with no more force than three hundred men, the counsel of people here was that an army should assemble and take your life and the lives of all of you men. And Thorolf was the head of these councils, and it was offered him that he should be king over all the Hologlanders and Naumstalmen. Then he went in and out of reach Firth and found all the islands and got together every man he could and every weapon and it was no secret that this army was to muster for battle against King Harald. But the truth is, O King, that you had a somewhat larger force, and the council last minute decided to meet you with friendly show, and to bid you your banquet, but it was still intended, when you were well drunk and lying asleep, to kill you with flames. And here is the proof to whether I am rightly informed. You were led into a granary, because Thorolf was loath to burn up his new beautiful hall, and further proof is that every room was full of weapons and armor. But when all the devices against them miscarried, then they chose the best course they could. They hushed up for their former purpose, and I know they will deny all of this because they are all guilty. Now this is my counsel, King. Keep Thorolf near you, and let him be in your guard, and be your standard bearer, and on the forecastle of your ship. And if you have him be a baron, then give him land in the south and the firths, where all his family and you may keep an eye on him. The king was very angry at these words, but he spoke quietly, as he did when he heard things of grave importance. He asked whether Thorolf were at home at Torgar. Harak said no, this was not likely. Thorolf, he said, is too wise. He must guess that you will find out his plot soon enough. He went north to a lost as soon as he heard you were on your way south. The king spoke little about this to other people, but you could see that it made him uneasy 
and that he believed every word that Horak told him. Chapter 13 Thorgil's Ghost the King There was a man named Thorgil Ziella, a house carl of Thorolf's, honored above all the rest of his household. He had followed Thorolf in his roving voyages as forecastle man and standard bearer. He had been in Harfa's Firth, in the fleet of King Harald, and was then steering the very ship that Thorolf had used in his roving. Thorgils was strong of body and bold of heart. The king had bestowed on him friendly gifts after the battle and promised him his friendship. Thorgils was manager at Torgar and bore rule there when Thorolf was not at home. Before Thorolf went away this time, he had counted over all the king's tribute that he had brought with him from the fells, and he put it at Thorgils' hand, bidding him to convey it to the king if he himself came not home before the king returned south. So Thorgils made ready a large ship of burden belonging to Thorolf and put the tribute on board, and taking about twenty men sailed southward to the king and found him in Nomdal. But when Thorgils met the king he gave him greeting from Thorolf and said that he had come there with the Finn's tribute sent by Thorolf. The king looked at him, but answered not a word, and all saw that the king was angry. Thorgils then went away, thinking to find a better time to speak with the king. He sought out Olvir Nuf and told him what had passed, and asked him if he knew what was wrong with the king. That I do not, said Olvir, but this I have marked that since we were at Lekka, the king is silent every time Thorolf is mentioned, and I suspect he has heard something grave about Thorolf. This I know of Hilderida's sons, that they were long in conference with the king, and it is easy to see from their words that they are Thorolf's enemies. But I will soon be certain about this from the king himself. Thereupon Olver went to the king and said, here is come Thorgil's Yeller, your friend, with tribute which is yours, and the tribute is much larger than it has ever been before, and far better wares. He is eager to be on his way. Be so, good king, is to go see it, for never have been such a good grey furs. The king answered not, but he went to where the ship lay. Thorgil's at once set forth the furs and showed them to the king. And when the king saw that it was true that the tribute was much larger and better, his brows somewhat cleared, and Thorgils got speech with him. He brought the king some bear skins which Thorolf sent him, and other valuables besides, which he had gotten upon the fells. So the king brightened up and asked tidings of the journey of Thorolf and his company. Thorgils told it all in great detail. Then said the king, Great pity is it Thorolf should be unfaithful to me and plot my death. Then answered many who stood by, and all with one mind, that it was the slander of wicked men if such words had been spoken, and Thorolf would be found guiltless. The king said he would prefer to believe this. Then was the king cheerful in all his talks with Thorgils, and they parted friends. But when Thorgils met Thorolf, he told him what had happened. Chapter 14 Thorolf Again in Finnmark That winter Thorolf went again to Finnmark, taking with him about a hundred men. As before, he held a fair with the Finns and traveled far and wide over Finnmark. But when he reached the far east and his coming was heard of, then came to him some Kvens, saying that they were sent by Faravid, king of Kvenland, because the Keralas were harrying his land, and his message was that Thorolf should go there and bear him help, and further that Thorolf should have a share of the treasure equal to the king's share, and each of his men as much as two Kvens. 
With the Kvans, the law was that the king should have one third as compared with his men when the treasure was shared, and beyond that as reserved for him all bearskins and sables. Thorolf put this proposal before his men, giving them the choice to go or not, and the more part chose to adventure, as the prize was so great. This was decided that they should go eastwards with the messengers. Finnmark is a wide tract. It is bounded westwards by the sea, where from large firths run in, by sea also northwards and round to the east, but southwards lies Norway, and Finnmark stretches along nearly all the inland region to the south, as also does Hologland outside. But eastwards from Naumdal is Jomtland, then Helsingland and Gwenland, then Finland, then Kiaraland. All along these lands to the north lies Finnmark, and there are wide inhabited fell districts, some in dales, some by lakes. The lakes of Finnmark are wonderfully large, and by the lakes there are extensive forests. But high fells lie behind from every end to end of the mark, and this ridge is called Keels. But when Thorolf came to Gwenland and met King Faravid, they made them ready for the march. Being three hundred of the king's men and a fourth hundred Norsemen, and they went by the upper way over Finnmark and came where the Kerales were on the fell, the same who had been before harried the Kvens. These, when they were there with the enemy, gathered themselves and advanced to meet them, expecting victory. But on the battle being joined, the Norsemen charged furiously forwards, bearing shields stronger than those of the Kvens. The slaughter turned to be in the Kiriales, ranks many fell, some fled. King Faravid and Thorolf took their immense wealth and returned to Kvenland, whence afterwards Thorolf and his men came to Finnmark, he and Faravid always parted in friendship. Thorolf came down from the fell to Vefsnir, and then went first to his farm at San Ness, stayed there a while, and in spring went with his men north to Torgar. But when he came there, it was told him how Hilderida's sons had been there winter at Trondheim with King Harald, and that they would not spare to slander Thorolf with the king, and it was much questioned what grounds they had for this slander. Thorolf answered thus, The king will not believe this, though such lies he laid before him, for there are no grounds for me turning traitor on him, when he had done me much good and no evil, and so far from wishing to do him harm, I would much rather be a baron of his than be called a king of my own, when some other fellow countrymen might rise and make me his thrall. Chapter 15 King Harald and Herrick Hilderida's sons had been that winter with King Harald, and in their company twelve men of their own household and neighbors. The brothers were often talking with the king, and they still spoke in the same evil way of Thorolf. Harak asked, Did you like well, O king, the Finn's tribute which Thorolf sent you? I did, said the king. Then would you have been surprised, said he, if you had received all that belonged to you? But it was far from being so. Thorolf kept for himself the larger share. He sent three bearskins, but I know for certain that he kept back thirty that were by right yours, and I guess it was the same with other things. This will prove true, O king that if you put the stewardship into the hand of myself and my brother, we will bring you much more wealth. And to all that they said Thorolf and their comrades bore witness. And at this the king became exceedingly angry. Chapter 16 Thorolf and the King in the summer, Thorolf went south to King Harald at Trondheim. 
taking with him all the tribute and much wealth besides, and ninety men well arrayed. When he came to the king, he and his men were placed in the guest hall, and entertained magnificently. On the morrow, Orvir Nuf went to his kinsman Thorolf. They talked together, Orvil saying that Thorolf was much slandered and the king gave ear to such tales. Thorolf asked Orvir to plead his case with the king, for, said he, I shall be short-spoken before the king if he choose rather to believe the lies of wicked men than the truth and honesty which he will find in me. The next day Orvir came to see Thorolf and told him he had spoken on this business with the king. But, said he, I know now more than before what is in his mind. Then I must myself go to him, said Thorolf. He did so. He went to the king. And the king greeted him. The king accepted his greeting and bade that they serve him with drink. Thorolf said that he had there the tribute belonging to the king from Finnmark, and yet a further portion of treasure he had brought present for you, the king. And what I bring will I know, owe all it's worth to this, that it is given to you, king, out of gratitude. The king said that he could expect naught but good from Thorolf, because, he said, I deserve nothing else. Yet men tell two tales of you, being careful to win my approval. I am not justly charged, said Thorolf. If any say I have shown disloyalty to you, this I think with the truth, that they who speak such lying slanders of me will prove to be not your friends, but it is quite clear that they are only my bitter enemies. It's likely, however, that they will pay dearly for what they have done to me. Then Thorolf went away. But on the morrow, Thorolf counted out the tribute in the king's presence. And when it was all paid, he then brought out some bear skins and sables, which he begged the king to accept. The king said that Thorolf had himself taken his own reward. Thorolf said that he had loyally done all he could to please the king, but if he likes it not, said he, I cannot help it. The king answered, You did bear yourself well, Thorolf, when you were with us, and this, I think, is best to do still, that you join my guard, bear my banner, be captain over the guard, then will no man slander you, if I can oversee night and day what your conduct is. Thorolf looked on either hand where stood his house carls, then said he, I can deliver to you, my followers, about your titles and grants to me, O king, you will have your own way, but my following I will not deliver up while my means last, for I am my own man, not a serving man. My request and wish, O king, is this, that you come and visit me at my home, and hear word of men whom you trust most, what witness they bear to me in this matter. Thereafter do as you find proof to warrant. The king answered and said that he would not again accept entertainment from Thorolf. So Thorolf went out and made ready to return home. But when he was gone, the king put into the hands of Hilderida's sons his business in Hologland, which Thorolf had had before, as also the Finnmark journey. The king claimed ownership of the estate of Torgar and of all the property that Brynjolf had had, and all this he gave into the keeping of Hilderida's sons. The king sent messages with tokens to Thorolf to tell him of this arrangement, whereupon Thorolf took the ships belonging to him, put on board all the chattels he could carry, and with all his men, both freed and thralls, sailed northwards to his farm at San Ness, where he kept up no fewer and no less state than he had before. Chapter 17 Hilderida's Sons in Finnmark and at Harald's Court Hilderida's sons took over Thorolf's business in Halogeland. The two brothers went on the fell in the winter, taking with them thirty men. 
To the Finns there seemed much less honor in these stewards than when Thorolf came, and the money due was far worse paid. That same winter Thorolf went up the fell with a hundred men. He passed on at once eastwards to Gvenland and met with King Faravid. They took counsel together and resolved to go on the fell again as in the winter before, and with four hundred men they made a descent on Kirland and attacked those districts for which they fought themselves a match in numbers, and herring there took much treasure returning up to Finnmark as the winter wore on. In the spring Thorolf went home to his farm, and then employed his men at the fishing in Vagar, and some in herring fishing, and had the take of every kind brought to his farm. Thorolf had a large ship which was waiting to put to sea, it was elaborate in everything, beautifully painted down to the sea line, with sails also carefully striped with blue and red, and all the tackling as elaborate as the ship. Thorolf had this ship made ready and put aboard some of his house carls and crew. He freighted it with dried fish and hides and ermine and grey furs too in abundance, and other pelts such as he had gotten from the fell. It was a most valuable cargo. This ship he bade sail westwards for England to buy him clothes and other supplies that he needed, and they first steering southwards along the coast, then stretching across the main came to England. There they found a good market, laded the ship with wheat and honey and wine and clothes, and sailing back in autumn with a fair wind came to Hordeland. That same autumn Hilderida's sons carried tribute to the king, but when they paid it to the king himself was present and saw, Is this tribute now paid all that ye took in Finnmark? It is, they answered. Less by far, said the king, and much worse paid is this tribute now than when Thorolf gathered it. Yet ye said that he managed this business ill. It is well, O king, said Harak, that you considered how large a tribute should usually come from Finnmark, because thus you know how much you lost, if Thorolf waste all the tribute before you. Last winter we were in Finnmark with thirty men. Soon after came Thorolf with a hundred men, and we learned this, that he meant to take the lives of us two brothers and all our followers. His reasons being that you, our king, had handed over to us the business that he wished to have. It was then our best choice to shun meeting him and to save our own lives. Therefore we quickly left the settled districts and went on the fell. But Thorolf went all around Finnmark with his armed warriors. He had all the trade. The Finns paid him tribute and he hindered their stewards from entering Finnmark. He meant to be made king over the north there, both over Finnmark and Hologoland, and the wonder is that thou wilt listen to him in anything whatever. Herein may true evidence be found of Thorolf's ill-gotten gains from Finnmark, for the largest merchant ship in Hologoland was made ready for sea at San Ness in the spring, and all the cargo on board was said to be Thorolf's. It was laden mostly, I think, with grey furs, but there would be found also bear skins and sables, more than Thorolf brought to you. And with that ship went Thorgil's Yella, and I believe he sailed westwards for England. But if thou wilt know the truth of this, set spies on the track of Thorgil's when he comes eastward, for I fancy that no trading ship in our days has carried such great amount of wealth. And I am telling you what is true, O king, when I say that thee belongs every penny on board, it is all yours. All that Herrick said, his companions confirmed, and none there ventured to gains. Chapter 18 Thorolf's ship is taken. There were two brothers named Sigtrig Travel Quick and Halvard Travel Hard, kinsmen of King Harald on their mother's side. 
From their father, a wealthy man, they had inherited an estate in Hysing. Four brothers there were in all, but Thor and Thorgir, the two younger, were at home and managed the estate. Sigtrig and Halvard carried all the king's messages, both within and without the land, and had gone on many dangerous journeys both for putting men out of the way and confiscating the goods of those whose homes the king ordered to be attacked. They kept about them a large following. They were not generally in favor, but the king prized them highly. None could match them at traveling, either on foot or on snowshoes. In voyaging also they were speedier than others. Valiant men they were, and very wary. These two men were with the king when those things happened that have just been told. In the autumn, the king went to a banquet in Hordaland, and one day he summoned to him the brothers Halvard and Sigtrig, and when they came, he bade them go with the following and spy after the ship which Thorgils had taken westward to England in the summer. Bring me, said he, the ship and all that is in it, except the men. Let them go their way in peace if they do not try to defend the ship. The brothers made them ready for this, and taking each one his longship, went to seek Thorgils, and learned that he was come from the west, and had sailed northwards along the coast. Northwards after him went they, and found him in fur sound. They knew the ship at once, and laid one of their ships on the seaward side of her, while some of them landed, and went out on the ship by the gangways. Thorgil's crew, apprehending no danger, made no defense. They found out nothing till the armed men were aboard, and so they were all seized and afterwards put on the shore weaponless, with nothing but the clothes that they wore. But Halvard's men drew out the gangways, loosed the cables, and towed out the ship then turned them about and sailed southwards along the coast till they met the king, to whom they brought the ship and all that was in it. And when the cargo was unloaded, the king saw that it was indeed great wealth, and what Horak had said was no lie. But Thorgils and his comrades got conveyance and went to Kveldulf and his son, and told of the misadventures of their voyage, yet were they well received. Kveldulf said all was tending to what he had forbaded, that Thorolf would not in the end have good luck in his friendship with King Harald. And I care little, said he, for if Thorolf's money loss in this, if worse does not come after, but I misdoubt as before that Thorolf will not rightly rate his own means against the stronger power with which he has to deal. And he bade Thorgil say this to Thorolf. My counsel is that you go away out of the land, for maybe you will do better for yourself if you serve under the king of England, or of Denmark, or of Sweden. Then he gave Thorgils a rowing cutter with tackling complete, a tent also and provisions, and all things needful for their journey. So they departed and stayed not their journey till they came to Thorolf and told him all that had happened. Thorolf took his loss cheerfully, and said that he should not be short of money. "'Tis good,' said he, to be in partnership with the king. He then bought meal and all that he needed for the maintenance of his people. His house carls must for a while, he said, be less bravely attired than he had purposed. Some lands he sold, some he mortgaged, but he kept up all expenses as before. He had no fewer men with him than last winter and even more, and as to feasts and friends entertained at his house, he had more means for all than his men. He stayed at home all that winter. Chapter 19 Thorolf Retaliates When spring came and the snow and ice were loosened, then Thorolf launched a large warship of his own, and he had it made ready and equipped his house carls taking with him more than a hundred men, and a goodly company they were, and well weaponed. And when a fair wind blew, Thorolf steered southwards along the coast till he came to Birda, and then they held an outer course outside the islands. 
frightened at times through channels between hill slopes. Thus they coasted on southwards and had no tidings of men till they came eastwards to Vik. There they heard that King Harald was in Vik, meaning in the summer to go into Upland. The people of the country knew nothing of Thorolf's voyage. With a fair wind he held on south to Denmark and thence into the Baltic, where he harried through that summer, but got no good treasure. In the autumn he steered back from the east to Denmark, at the time when the fleet at Erar was breaking up. In the summer there had been, as was usual, many ships from Norway. Thorolf let all the vessels sail past and did not show himself. One day, at eventide, he sailed into Mostra Sound, where in the haven was a large ship of burden that had come from Erar. The steersman was named Thorir Thruma. He was a steward of King Harald's, manager of his farm at Thruma a large farm in which the king used to make a long stay when he was in Vik. Much provision was needed for this farm and Thorir had gone to Erar for this to buy a cargo, malt, wheat and honey, in which wealth of the king he had had for no end. Thorolf made for this ship and offered Thorir and his crew the choice to defend themselves, but as they had no force to make defense against such numbers they yielded. The ship with all its freight Thorolf took, but Thor he put out on an island. Then he sailed northwards along the coast with both the ships, but when they came to the mouth of the Elbe they lay there and waited for night, and when it was dark they rowed their long ship up the river and stood in for the farm buildings belonging to Halvard and Sigtrig. They came there before daybreak and formed a ring of men around the place, then raised a war whoop and wakened those within, who quickly leapt up to their weapons. Thorgir at once fled from his bedchamber. Round the farmhouse were high wooden palings. At these Thorgir leapt, grasping with his hands the stakes, and so swung himself out to the yard. Thorgil's yellow was standing near. He made a sweep with his sword at Thorgir and cut off his hand along with the fence stake. Then Thorgir escaped to the wood, but Thord, his brother, fell slain there and more than twenty men. Thorolf's band plundered and burnt the house, then went back down the river to the sea. With a fair wind they sailed north to Vik. There again they fell in with a large merchant ship belonging to men of Vik, laden with malt and meal. For this ship they made, but those on board deeming they had no means of defense yielded, and were disarmed and put on shore, and Thorolf's men taking the ship and its cargo went on their way. Thorolf had now three ships, with which he sailed westwards by fold. Then they took the high road of the sea, to Lindon's Ness, going with an all dispatch, but making raid and lifting cattle on Ness and shore. Northwards from Lindon's Ness they held a course further out, but pillaged wherever they touched land. But when Thorolf came over against the Firths, then he turned his course inward, and went to see his father, Kveldulf, the Night Wolf, and there they were made welcome. Thorolf told his father what had happened in the summer voyage. He stayed there but a short time, and Kveldulf and his son Grim accompanied him to the ship. But before they parted, Thorolf and his father talked together, and Kveldulf said, I was not far wrong, Thorolf, in telling you, when you went to join King Harald's guard, that neither you nor we Thy kindred would in the long run get good fortune from him. Now you have taken up the very counsel against which I warned you, and matched your forces against King Harald's. But though you are well endowed with valor and prowess, you not have luck enough for this, to play on even terms with the king, a thing wherein no one here in this land has succeeded. After this, Thorolf embarked and went his way, and no tidings are told of his voyage till he arrived home at Sandness, 
and caused to be conveyed to his farm all the treasure he had taken, and had his ship set up upon land. There was no lack of provision to keep his people through the winter. Thorolf stayed on at home with no fewer men than in the winter before. Chapter 20 Skallagrim's Marriage There was a man named Ingvar, powerful and wealthy. He had been a baron of the former kings. But after Harald came to the throne, Ingvar sat at home and served not the king. Ingvar was married and had a daughter named Bera. Ingvar dwelt in the firths. Bera was his only child and heiress. Grim, Kveldulf's son, asked Bera to wife, and the match was arranged. Grim took Bera in the winter following the summer when Thorolf had parted from him and his father. Grim was twenty-five years old and was now bald, wherefore he was henceforth called Skallagrim. He had the management of all the farms belonging to his father and himself all of the produce. Though Kveldulf was yet a hale and strong man, they had many freedmen about them, and many men who had grown up there and at home and were about Skallagrim's equals in age. Men of prowess and strength they were mostly, for both father and son chose strong fellows to be their followers and trained them after their own mind. Skallagrim was like his father, in stature and in strength. Chapter 21 Halvard and his brother go after Thorolf. King Harald was in Vik while Thorolf was hurrying, and in the autumn he went to Upland, and thence northward to Trondheim, where he stayed through the winter with a large force. Sigtrig and Halvard were with him, they had heard that Thorolf had done at their house on Hysing, what scathe he had brought wrought on men and property. They often reminded the king of this, and how Thorolf had plundered the king and his subjects and had gone about harrying within the land. They begged the king's leave that they two brothers might go with their usual following and attack Thorolf in his home. The king answered this, Ye may think ye have good cause for taking Thorolf's life, but I doubt your fortune falls far short of this work. Thorolf is more than your match, brave, and he may deem you yourselves less than he. The brothers said that his would be put to the proof if the king would grant them leave. They had often run great risk against men on whom they had less to avenge, and generally they had won the day. So when spring came and men made ready to go to their own separate ways, then did Halvard and his brother again urge their request that they might go and take Thorolf's life. So the king gave them leave, and I know, he said, you will bring me his head and many good things when you come back. 